Okay, so my name is Joe Holiday, as you just heard. Perfect last name to have because I'm a travel fanatic, and um, that's the other thing I'd like to talk to you about, not just the Earth science of polar regions, but basically any place on Earth to travel to. So I'm hoping to get to talk to a lot of you during the next two weeks. Um, I I'm purposely wear this hat because, number one, I'm glare sensitive, and there's really bright lights here. And number two, it's so you can find me. I find that's a great way for also name tags, but even the hat's easier to find me. Even my colleagues find me that way across the dining room. So, so um, I have been teaching for 30 years at um, El Camino College in Los Angeles area. And I'm really into field trips, though. I, uh, that's my obsession, is field studies. And part of that was, has been working and traveling around the world and learning how people experience education, science education, in the real world, not in a lecture format. So this is sort of weird that we do lectures, but what we really want you to do is go outside when we get there and experience the real thing. Um, all these pictures are mine, so they're not copyrighted or anything, but the, um, but, um, the maps, are, of course, are not mine. You should recognize this one, right? Okay, and we are where the yellow dot is, t or star is today, and and what I, do you know where to get this in your room? Where do you, yeah, you go to channel 12, and here's my big travel hint. I've told thousands of people through your, take a picture of this every morning, and it's a place saver on your phone or your camera, and you'll get the dates right, because the scenery starts to look the same, when you're in each region. And it's a great way to have a time-dated map, basically, of where you are. And so that's my hint. Set your alarm every day <laughs> to take that picture. And it could be at night before you go to bed. It could be in the morning, whatever. So it's a handy thing. OK, so where is Antarctica? I think all of you know since you were little kids. It's down at the bottom of the world. Well, that's. That's our perception. It's, it's in the south end of the world, and it hasn't always been there, as we will talk about. These are distances, if you're interested in the exact distances, to like when you're emailing home. You know, we're about 6,000 miles away from the nearest part of the United States, where we will be 500 miles from the southern tip of Argentina. And it's just an impressive figure to tell your friends, <laughs> social media. This is more important when you're here, though, which you guys are. We're all here. Oh, by the way, do you know how many people actually get to see Antarctica every year? Less than 200,000 people. That's such a tiny percentage. You can't even name a town for that few people. So you're in the privileged, experienced uh, 170,000. OK, so the size of Antarctica, though, we're not gonna see the whole thing. You can't see the whole thing, it's a continent. It's about the same size as Canada, if you include, let's say, Greenland. Canada? Oh, we got this here. All right, it's the same size as China. Anybody from China? Okay, no, they're not traveling yet, but they, they will be next year. Australia. Okay, if you include Australia and New Guinea and New Zealand, that's about the size of it, and United States, if you include not one, but two Alaskas, okay? So it's pretty big. Okay, the geography, we're not gonna go visit the whole thing. In fact, the 170,000 people don't visit the whole thing. They almost all go to the peninsula, which is on the left side of this diagram. And the reason we go there, the, wild, uh, the weather is milder, so you can actually get a ship in. And that's sort of important, right? <laughs> Hmm, imagine that. And then the South Shetland Islands are way over on the left side, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time when we're down there. But it's all part of Antarctica, the islands, the peninsula, the mainland. Um, some people might refer to, well, you've got three speakers here, and uh, they might refer to western and eastern Antarctica. The western is in the western hemisphere. That's where the peninsula is. And... The eastern part is the big mainland thing that's covered with ice that no, hardly anybody visits. Okay, if you were to take all the ice away, 
two miles of ice, two miles, that's three kilometers of ice. If you were to take it away, this is what Antarctica would look like. It looks a little different, doesn't it? Yeah, and you can see there's vast areas that would be flooded by water. The same in Greenland, by the way, any place that has an ice cap, or North America, Europe, during the ice ages, same idea. And why is that? Because ice is heavy. You've known that. You've carried bags of ice, blocks of ice. You know ice weighs a lot, right? Well, two miles, three kilometers of ice pressing down is like you sitting on your bed. When you sit or sleep on a bed or, um, or the cushion you're sitting on right now, it presses it down, right? When you get up, it comes back up. Well, the crust does the same thing, but it takes thousands, tens of thousands of years to do that. So if all the ice melts in Antarctica um, it, over the next 200 years, <laughs> this is what Antarctica will look like. All right, and as I've already mentioned, um, I worked, I've been down here for 13 seasons. I've worked with some really impressive people and visited some really cool places. Uh, Tori mentioned being at McMurdo. I've been to Palmer Research Station. And my first trip down here, I got to share it with, anybody recognize that guy? Yeah, Buzz Lightyear. No, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's what young people call him, but he's Buzz Ald Aldrin. To, Anybody old enough to remember the Apollo program? Oops. And um, anyway, if you want to know personal stuff, I don't talk about it over the microphone, but I'll tell you personal stuff about Buzz. <laughs> okay. All right, so geology. As I mentioned before, one of my degrees is in ge geology, and that was my primary job at the college. A and so you'll learn more about geology than you probably have ever learned in your life on this, during this journey. By the way, are there any geologists in the audience? They're, we're a pretty rare breed, all right? There's only 40,000 in the United States, and so I don't know the number for UK or Argentina. And I'm gonna start off with the big picture and work your way down, and a lot of people think geologists just like rocks. <laughs> I actually don't, I'm not a rock kind of geologist, I'm more of a map and plate tectonics and, and the time, four dimensions and everything. But we start off with a big picture here. This is a geologic map of Antarctica as best as we can figure out based on drilling through the ice and going around. It's a hard continent because it's covered with miles, kilometers of ice. But there's three main features. Almost everybody, <laughs> including all of us, when we see Antarctica, we're only experiencing what's in yellow there. And that's the southern extension of the Andes Mountains. And the Andes Mountains are the southern extension of the Cascade Mountains and the Alaska Mountains. It's basically one long mountain range that comes all the way from Denali up in Alaska all the way down into Antarctica. We really don't talk too much about that center stretch but just so you know, there is another mountain range. It's like having the Rocky Mountains way inland or, or the, that kind of thing. And then there's some, uh, the, in brown is an old, old rock like they have up in the Canadian Shield or in Brazil. It's really old and it's eroded down because it's billions of years old. I'm really not gonna talk about that because we're not gonna see it. Here's another way, much simpler way. This is the reality. <laughs> That blue-green color you see there, that's all that ice. So we can only see rocks and the amazing cool features if you're where the colors are. And notice the peninsula where we're going. The peninsula and the islands, they have all the colors, right? So we're going to see rocks. It's not going to be 100% ice. But even then, I think your biggest surprise when we get there is how much ice there is, even though that's the warmest place in Antarctica. Okay, so big picture um, it, it is Pangaea is plate tectonics and Pangaea. Plate tectonics, all the continents are on plates and they're moving around. They're moving around like bumper cars, if you're familiar with that, um, billiard balls, something like that. And they're constantly moving around and this is a concept that's been taught in schools since the 1970s, so I think you're familiar with this. So I'm starting out with the most familiar diagram, which is Pangaea. And this has not happened just once, but multiple times. But the last time it, they all came together, 
It was about 200 million years ago. And there's different ways to show that this is um, a really cool diagram from Productive Teacher. This is the kind of diagram they're teaching in elementary schools all around the world in all 200 countries. And it's, uh, I think it's easier to understand if you color the consonants <laughs> um, because that's what we're familiar with. Okay, but what a geologist see sees and even uh, the biologists who study evolution and, and uh, figure out where these different um, plants have been and different fossils is we view the world in a fourth dimension. The continents are constantly moving around and they're coming together, they're coming apart. And this is how a scientist views the world. The light blue areas are continental shelves, very, very shallow areas. Uh, we're rich in life though, that's where a lot of evolution, a lot of the marine life has been. It's not just about mountain ranges, which are shown in brown. The way a biologist views it is that there, as evolution has been occurring, it often happens when, play, uh, when species get isolated onto continents or they have a, a change in climate. And so uh, uh, evolutionary biologists views it the same way as a geologist, is it's a, it's a fourth dimensional puzzle that we've been putting together since the discovery of plate tectonics in the 1960s. So this is a diagram, rather confusing diagram, but it, it's the kind that shows that we look at the fossils, not just animal fossils like dinosaurs, but also plants. And we can see where they've lived by going back and we can date every fossil. We know every fossil, let's say within a million years of when it existed as a living form. So that helps us put together all these continents and so it's not just the shapes, like a jigsaw puzzle, but it's also the fossils. Have you ever done a jigsaw puzzle? Yeah, you don't just put shapes together, you use colors and textures, right? Well, geologists use the shapes of the, of the plates, the continents, and then the, the, we use the fossil ages and the rock types. And so it's basically a big, huge jigsaw puzzle to us. So, the continents have been pulling apart for 170 million years, 200 million years. At what speed? About one inch a year, about two and a half centimeters. So what part of your body moves at, grows at one and a half, I mean two and a half centimeters, one inch a year? Your hair is too fast. The continents move slower than your hair grows. Hmm, I wonder. Your fingernail, yeah, yeah. So. Everything's moving at fingernail growing speed. Not your toenails, your fingernails, okay? <laughs> no, actually it varies. It's somewhere between toenail and fingernail speed, okay? And when, very important for everything we see in Antarctica, extremely important is the split between Antarctica and South America, because as you know, you've been to South America, you know it can get pretty hot, right? <laughs> And in Antarctica, I think you know, is pretty cold. And the reason is they're split apart. There's currents and other things I'll be talking to you about uh, later in the journey of why Antarctica is so cold. But it all has to do with the split that occurred. And during the split about 60 million years ago, this is about the time the dinosaurs got wiped out. It's about that same kind of, so it's a um, same time of Earth history. And the split occurred and basically the Antarctic Peninsula that you'll be seeing is broke apart from the Southern Andes or what you might call Patagonia. So how does all this plate tectonics happen? Okay, the plates are moving around. They're, um, they're, uh, we, it's more than just the crust, but, so we call it lithosphere plates, but you can call it the crust if you want. And the crust moves around and the earth is split into about a dozen of these plates, They're these big plates. One's the North American plate, and there's the Asian plate, and the Australian plate. And they're all moving around. And so it's, it's impossible for them not to collide. If they collide together, one dives underneath the other one. I'll be talking about that more. And that's what you see on the right and the left side of this diagram is 
one plate goes underneath another. We call that subduction, more on that later. Then the other thing that has to happen is the plates have to pull apart. If you've got 12 plates all moving in all different directions, some of them have to be pulling apart. And when that happens, you get some exciting things. So we call that um, a divergent plate boundary, and I'll be talking about that too. Okay, so let's, before I get into the specifics about that, I want to talk to you about the plate, the continental plate, the tectonic plate. You've probably never heard of. You've heard of Antarctica, which is shown in orange, but the plate itself is much, much bigger. As you can see, it's three or four times bigger than, the, than Antarctica itself. It's all that stuff at the bottom of the map <laughs> is all on its separate plate. It's one of these 12 plates or so that are moving around, big plates, big plates. Uh, that are moving around, and uh, the, where they're pulling apart from other plates is shown in red, particularly on the right side of this diagram, and where they're coming together and causing collision is where we're going, the Antarctic Peninsula, shown on the left side of this diagram with the white arrows. That's where a lot of excitement is happening. Okay. Now, there's mini plates, <laughs> okay? And we call them micro plates. These are not part of the big 12. These are smaller ones, and as we go along, we study, we are finding more and more of these, and uh, because we have more and more time to study, you know, this field of plate tectonics has only been around during my lifetime. And, and so it's a relatively recent science. But one of the plates you'll be crossing for a day, a day and a half, is this Scotia Plate. You've probably never even heard of it. <laughs> and it's named after the South Scotia Islands, and so we are going to be uh, mo moving across that. And you won't know it. it it's oceanic crust, and you, you won't be able to tell. But notice I'm getting down, down there's um, another plate down there, and this is the smallest plate that I can name, <laughs> and I call it a nano plate, <laughs> um, and it's, uh, we, we're gonna spend uh, much of our two days in this area on the sh South Shetland Islands. You have to say that very carefully. <laughs> South Shetland Islands, okay. And, um, and so there's even a smaller plate there. So anyway, plate tectonics is really fascinating if you, want to talk about it, you know where I am, you know what I look like for the next two weeks. So before I turn the slide though, I do want to tell you there's a little micro, one of the smallest subduction zones in the world is right there at the South Shetland Islands, and we're going to hopefully see one of the volcanoes as a result of that. Okay, so geology, <coughs> the other kind of rock star. So um, I already mentioned a little bit uh, that what geology is. It's n I think you know it by now. It's not just rocks. <laughs> okay, I'm not a rock guy. All right, it is not just fossils. It's also all this four-dimensional moving around. What I'm going to talk about from now on, though, is more typical of what uh, most geologists do and study. Okay, the plate boundaries. The one third of the plate boundaries on Earth are divergent. Divergent means pulling apart, spreading. So these are plates. How thick are these plates? Oh, 40, 50, 60 miles thick. So that's like 100 kilometers thick that are moving around, as I said, each one moving about an inch a year, two, three centimeters a year. Well, where they pull apart, amazing things happen. And number one, it's you get magma, you get this basalt magma, and places like Iceland have a lot of basalt. Has anybody been to Iceland here? It's real popular. Uh, and uh, I'm leading a group there in September, so um, I, I really like Iceland a lot. It's the Yellowstone of Europe, okay? And the reason why Iceland is 100% basalt lava is because the magma's coming up there where the plates are pulling apart and it's creating brand new plate. The plates are adding to themselves. It's like, it's like taking a welding um, torch and then adding more metal to a ship or something like that. They're actually getting larger at that same speed, about one inch a year, 
a couple centimeters a year. Antarctica, if you've ever looked at the map, if you're a map kind of person, you'll notice it has two huge seas. Each one of these seas is like huge. They're like the size of France or, um, or Argentina. In fact, they're even the shape of Argentina. They're triangle shaped. And these seas were, were formed by smaller rift inside the plate. So you don't have to just have the rifting between the plates like shown in this diagram. And but you can also have them inside the plate. And this is a rather fascinating concept because this also explains some of the great seas around the world, like the Gulf of Mexico was formed this way, and the Arctic Ocean was formed this way. And so if you see these weird shapes in a continent, often they're caused by this triangle-shaped rifting. It opens up like a, like a hand fan. It's very bizarre. And in the United States, even Nevada is doing that, and Baja and the uh, Gulf of California. And Gulf of California might ex eventually extend up into Nevada. Not in our lifetime, though. <laughs> All right, divergent is, w w as we said, um, we, well, we talked about convergent. Now we're talking about divergent. Sorry, we, <laughs> we talked about divergent. Now we're talking about convergent. All right, these are where plates come together at that same speed, you know, the fingernail growing speed. And one plate goes underneath the other. If this, and when that happens is a new word they invented like 60 years ago called subduction. Sub meaning going down. And so you got a whole edge of a plate, a whole ocean seafloor going underneath a continent in this situation. And that's where big excitement happens, okay. And uh, this is where you get the biggest earthquakes in the world, the biggest tsunamis in the world, and the biggest volcanoes in the world. So, and I'll be talking about more of that in the, later in the, in the journey. <coughs> okay. And I already mentioned that when Antarctica split off, that changed the whole climate of Antarctica. That's when Antarctica got separated by ocean currents and basically became a refrigerator. And so now it's the refrigerator of the world. And so think of it as like the refrigerator used to be part of the oven <laughs> and, and now they're, they're split apart. And this is the most important thing when, when you're talking to a biologist is the, the, or a glaciologist, someone who studies glaciers, is this happened. It wasn't overnight. The, sp the original split ha happened 60 million years ago, but it had to widen out, wide enough to get an ocean current to flow through there. So it took about 20 million years of that moving one inch a year <laughs> before it was wide enough for the currents to go through. So, you wanna see the currents? There they are. More on that later on in another talk when we're actually crossing the Drake Passage. I'll be talking about the currents and the oceanography of the Southern Ocean. But all that swirly stuff going around, those are all currents, okay? They go a little faster than one inch a year, <laughs> okay? Uh, and they are what isolates Antarctica and allows it to be so cold. On that note, do you know the, the sentence you gotta say every day for the next week? Antarctica is the coldest driest and windiest continent on Earth. So everybody say that together. Claire Isabel, I heard every word you said. Yeah, so every time I speak, you're gonna hear me say that. It's the coldest, windiest, and driest. And you're like, dry? Dry? It's got all that ice. Well, it's so cold that ice doesn't melt. It just accumulates. But it's dry, most of Antarctica is a desert. Okay, and so as I mentioned, I've worked with Buzz Aldrin, I've worked with another famous astronaut I'll mention in a f previous talk. And some are very serious, like Buzz Aldrin, and some are not so serious. <laughs> yeah. Did anybody bring a, a, a costume like this? <laughs> Seriously, there's gotta be somebody on the ship. No, okay. You, you watch, they'll, they'll be out on the bow, they'll be doing the Titanic. <laughs> when the bow's open, the bow will be open in Antarctica. 
and I can just see the penguin on the, on the front. Okay, so I mentioned volcanoes a few times. We will be seeing at least one volcano in the remnants, but mostly remnants. And a couple, I'll just start out with the, the rocks. A couple of the rocks that are formed by volcanoes are, you're all familiar with lava. If you've been to Hawaii or you've been to Iceland, those are both made out of basalt lava. It's black, you can make it out, it's usually a flat layer. But there's a lot of ash here because it's a, uh, the, the volcanoes we'll see were formed by subduction zone. There's a lot of ash. And the ash is an unusual color. What do you see in that? It's sort of like a yellow color, right? And you're not used to seeing that in most of these other places that we've mentioned. And this is how, uh, the peninsula. This is the first time you've seen a geologic map probably in your whole life. But this is how geologists map things. These are, don't represent animals or plants or political. There's no political divisions here. This is just rocks, OK? And the, just to show you the percentage, you don't have to read any of the words, uh, but the yellow and the green are volcanic rocks. The yellow are really recent, like the, when the, and the green are sometime since the big split occurred. So there's a lot of volcano areas. We're gonna be on the upper most part of this diagram, those islands and peninsula up there. But there's one volcano we're hoping to get near, but as Tori said, everything's flexible. It's an expedition kind of thing, and you gotta sort of just, we have to see how the weather permits, and you know, if there's fog or snow or wind, we'll see. But one of the volcanoes we're hoping to get next to is Deception Island, okay? And we're getting to get next to it, not go into it, okay? <laughs> okay, and you can see it's this perfect round, um, it's a volcano crater. It's actually a caldera. And I'm gonna poll you guys. Has any of you been to Crater Lake in Oregon? All right, six miles across, caldera, collapsed volcano. Has anybody been to Santorini in, in Italy? Whoa, a lot. Six miles across, 10 kilometers across, collapsed volcano. And hopefully we'll all go to Deception Island, which is six miles, 10 kilometers across, collapsed volcano. Isn't that cool? There's three of these. There's actually another one, um, Nagorogoro Crater in Africa. Uh, so there's four on four different continents that are all about the same width, same story, a little different ages. Yeah, so it's a sort of a cool thing if you're a world traveler to start connecting these different things. How does a volcano collapse? Think of a big volcano, you know, the size of Mount Rainier or Mount Fuji um, or uh, Cotopaxi, something like that. How does it collapse? Well, these have eruptions and may happen once in every million years on the, in, the, in the course of a volcano's lifetime. But what it is is they have these runaway eruptions and are thought, they're like geysers they j or steam explosions and they just erupt for like a month and they just pour out and it comes out as ash. It doesn't come out as lava. And then it creates basically a, a bubble underneath the volcano and then the weight of the volcano collapses in. And that's what forms these calderas. It's an amazing thing. It hasn't happened in Earth history very often, thank goodness, but Santorini happened in Earth history. It, it led to the collapse of a whole civilization. So, and you may have heard of Yellowstone. Yellowstone's probably the most famous caldera in the United States. It's happened twice over the last two million years. So it's not gonna happen in our lifetime. Don't worry about it. You can go to Yellowstone. Okay. All right, here's a view looking down at Deception Island. And on the day we get to Deception Island, you definitely should take a picture of that navigation screen uh, when you maybe come in to warm up or something like that. Um, because it's, you should be able to see this donut and may put you in the mood for donuts or something. But someone, someone took a bite out of the donut in the lower right corner. And that's where we're gonna be cruising in the lower right part because it's, it's interesting. You can see the entrance to the volcano. This volcano actually erupted in the late 60s. We actually have color movies <laughs> of the eruption and it happened over on the right side uh, where it's dark gray. Um, and, but it hasn't happened in so long 
in, you know, what is that, 50 years, that it's had time for the snow to accumulate and now it's covered back up with ice. So you can't see the most recent eruption. But we're gonna hang out there and maybe, maybe, see those little, those little animals that you're all coming to see. Hmm. I can't imagine what animal that would be. So, um, but uh, when we're waiting to see those little animals or see, there's uh, some amazing geology. So I just wanna show you that some of the things you might see. Number one, you, you see some erosional features like that black <laughs> thumb looking thing sticking up out. We call that a sea stack. All right, so you get some good, good scenery there. But I wanna draw your attention that you can look for some unique rocks that are really hard to find in the rest of the world. One is you see that yellowish rock. Depending on the weather, you know, it can look bright yellow or it can look dark yellow. <laughs> okay, but there is tuff there. Tuff is an Italian word and it just means an ash rock. And in this climate down here, ash doesn't stay white like it, you might find it in, let's say, Crater Lake or Santorini. Here it weathers into, it de decomposes into a yellow clay, so it can look yellow. So if you see a yellow rock in, in a volcano, on a volcano, near a volcano, in Antarctica, it's probably this ash rock. Another one that's hard to see depending on the weather conditions is the red cinder cones. And we have these cinder cones anywhere there's volcanoes. You have them in Iceland, you have them in Yellowstone, you have them in Japan, you have them in Ecuador. Um, any place there's volcanoes, you're gonna have cinder cones and their distinctive color is red. And you, ca there, you can't see the cinder cone here, but what you can see at the entrance there is half a cinder cone. <laughs> and it, got buried, and then because of the big eruption, it got exposed, and so if you see any red, it's an old cinder cone, thousands, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years old. Okay, and then occasionally you might see this, and those, they look like black walls that uh, go through the rock, and, and those are f called volcanic dikes, and they're formed by the lava coming up through a crack, because the lava's gotta come up from underneath, so it can't just flow out, it has to come up. And it doesn't usually come up through a hole, it usually comes up through a crack, that crack fills up with lava, and then that lava becomes a hard rock. Okay, there are a few metamorphic rocks on land, and weather permitting, conditions permitting, wind, all that kind of stuff, if we get into Paradise Bay, there's some metamorphic rocks in there, and those are rocks that are formed by being squished, yes, that's a geologic term, squished, compressed, okay? And, um, and then this is, if you have binoculars out, if you're looking for penguins, and you might actually be able to make out some green. And maybe you'll hear my voice over the loudspeaker saying, there's a green rock over there at 10 o'clock. Does that mean you're gonna see it at 10 o'clock? That means the way the ship is oriented. Does everybody know that? The front of the ship is called 12 o'clock, the back of the ship, six o'clock, and then nine o'clock, and then over to the, yeah. You'll hear all sorts of things like starboard and port, but if you use those old clocks, it's easier for all of us to understand. So if you like see a whale and you wanna run and tell one of us, say, there's a whale at three o'clock, we will know you're not talking about 3 p.m., okay? <laughs> Or if you hear us say, there's a whale at 10 o'clock, you go, oh, it's only nine, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> you miss the whale. All right, there are some sedimentary rocks. Um, this is what most of the rocks in where you're from are from. You know, most countries have a lot of sedimentary rocks like limestone, sandstone. A lot of our national parks around the world are made out of sedimentary rocks. You can tell those by the flat layers. But what I think is most fascinating about sedimentary rocks are the fossils. And as I said, I've been down here a lot, and I've, I've these, this is my hand and the photo. I have found the most amazing fossils because no one else has been there. <laughs> and you're like finding the fossils on the ground. And so I have to tell you a fun story. We laid out all the fossils in a circle and I called it the, the Holiday Museum of Paleontology. 
and it's the only one on Snow Hill Island, and it's probably still there. <laughs> it's just a circle of fossils because we could, you can't collect anything without permits, and so I left it all behind. So maybe you can see it on Google or Google Earth. Okay, just some more fossils. Most of the fossils here, or there, at Snow Hill Island, were Mesozoic, that's dinosaur age, you know? So what do you associate with dinosaurs? Warm or cold climates? Hint, they were cold-blooded animals. Yeah, they had needed to live in warm climates, so, if you f um, so it was much warmer back then. And, and so Antarctica's gone through the climate um, change because of that separation, isolation, and then the currents going around it, and then basically becoming like a refrigerator. Okay, so you got a brief overview of geology, and you may be sitting there going, who the hell cares? I came to see penguins. <laughs> Give me penguins, and maybe a whale. Okay, well, who cares about the geology? The penguins do. <laughs> Why? The penguins need to have bare rock to land on, okay, at least during their egg laying season, maybe not at the beginning of the season, but they need to lay their egg, the penguins in Antarctica, not necessarily the ones you'll see in South America during the next few days. But the ones in Antarctica, they need to have bare land, bare rock, and I'm sure Tori will tell us a lot more of that because they make their nests out of rock because there's no vegetation. You gotta make it out of something. So the penguins are geologists. They're, they're there to find the bare rock. Now, they don't know about plate tectonics, like you now know, right? They don't know about subduction zones, but they, they care about the rocks, okay? So hopefully, you care about rocks, <laughs> okay? So if you have any questions, we are going to be up at headquarters every day um, on sea days from, uh, from four to five. Did you hear where it was? directly above us, up near the library, and that's when we take questions. So hopefully, if you have any questions now, what I would do is write them down or type them into your phone and ask me up there, all right? Because we love questions. The harder the question, the better it is. Just remember who you're aiming for. <laughs> if it's a non-living, earthy kind of question, you might want to come to me first. Um, if it's a penguin question, whales, living creatures, birds, um, aim for Tori, and if it's a history question, aim for Liam, right? We all look very, very different, okay? <laughs> all right, and so uh, we look forward to meeting you. We have two whole weeks. You can approach me at any time. You can approach us even at breakfast, lunch, whatever, and ask us questions because we're here for you, and most important, we're here for the same reason you are, which is to share the joys of Antarctica. It's the most amazing place on earth. Thank you.